Blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known. And from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. <laughs> So with you. Let us pray. O God, who on the holy mount revealed to chosen witnesses your well beloved Son, wonderfully transfigured in raiment white and glistening, mercifully grant that we, being delivered from the disquietude of this world, may by faith. Behold the King in his beauty, who with you, O Father, and you, O Holy Spirit, lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, whose most dear Son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain, and entered not into glory before he was crucified. Mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the second book of Kings. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. 
But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they are both standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. And the water was parted to the one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me, what may I do for you before I am taken from you? Elisha said, please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, you have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elisha ascended and a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Elijah. 
He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down from the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The name William Reed Huntington probably doesn't ring a bell for you. It didn't for me until I went off years ago uh, to General Seminary in New York City to be properly Anglicanized before getting ordained to the Episcopal priesthood. And I learned William Reed Huntington is an important Anglican, an important Episcopalian. He was rector of Grace Church in New York City in the latter part of the 19th century. And unlike me, I, I served one term as a deputy to the House of Deputies at the General Convention of the Episcopal Church, and one term was plenty for me. Thank you very much. Unlike me, however, Huntington was a member of the House of Deputies from 1871 to 1907 
almost right up until his death in 1909, which sounds like a fate worse than death, to be a deputy for that long. But not surprisingly, his tenacity and longevity paid off. And Huntington is credited with providing the groundwork and framework for what came to be known as the Chicago Lambeth Quadrilateral, a landmark in church unity for the Anglican communion and its attempt to find the, the means of union, of unity, not just with other Anglican churches throughout the world, but with other communions, other denominations as well. Quadrilateral suggests there are four somethings. And indeed, this quadrilateral was what Huntington and company came up with as the, the four non-negotiables that we all had to agree on to be in communion with each other. As it states in the document, these four are essential to the restoration of unity among the divided branches of Christendom. And these four essentials are, one, the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testament as the revealed Word of God, two, the Nicene Creed as the sufficient statement of the Christian faith, three, the two sacraments, baptism and the supper of the Lord, ministered with unfailing use of Christ's words of institution and of the elements ordained by him, and four, the historic episcopate, locally adapted in the methods of its administration to the varying needs of the nations and peoples called of God into the unity of his church. In other words, the Bible, the Nicene Creed, baptism and Eucharist, and bishops. You can imagine that this went over better with the, the communions, the, the denominations that already had those four, and not surprisingly, the historic episcopate, bishops, continued to be a stumbling block to unity for those folks who didn't have bishops and didn't really want them. I mean, oh, you know, if only the thing nowadays that stood in the way of the unity of the church was bishops. But they did stand in the way back then, and for some, continue to do. But nonetheless, the Chicago Lambeth Quadrilateral, Huntington, and the others who worked on it, I mean, they get an E for effort, an, an E for ecumenism. I mean, this was a very important step in the history of ecumenical relationships, the attempt at reaching out to others that you may disagree with on some pretty important things, but nonetheless think that there's something to the fact that we are brothers and sisters in Christ and that we need each other and that I, we, need to find some way to not only acknowledge you as a member of the family, but to treat you as a member of the family, and not the kind of treatment received in dysfunctional, inhospitable families, but healthy families, which have capacity for hospitality and generosity, particularly for family members they disagree with. So, this important document, the Chicago Lambeth Quadrilateral, has been enshrined, if you will, in the most recent 1979 Book of Common Prayer, tucked away in the back in what's called the Historical Documents section, right there along with the, the 39 Articles, the Athanasian Creed, the Chalcedonian Definition. The Chicago Lambeth Quadrilateral is that important to be included along with all those other important creeds and confessions. So, it's not surprising that for all of these things, William Reed Huntington has his own feast day in the Episcopal Church on July 27th. But what he did for August 6th is important as well. August 6th is the Feast of the Transfiguration. And it's Huntington, Huntington more than anyone else, who brought that feast into prominence in the Episcopal Church, moving it from a mere afterthought to a prominent red letter day, right there in the company of feasts like the Annunciation and the Ascension. And while at General, General Seminary, I learned that the, the collect, the prayer for the Feast of the Transfiguration is his. Huntington wrote that prayer. And it's that prayer we heard Mother Susan pray for us this morning. O oh God, 
who on the holy mount revealed to chosen witnesses your well-beloved son, wonderfully transfigured, in raiment white and glistening. Mercifully grant that we, being delivered from the disquietude of this world, may by faith behold the king in his beauty. Now, today is obviously not the Feast of the Transfiguration. It's not August 6th. I mean, if only it were August 6th, maybe most of us would be vaccinated by then, maybe at least sitting outside in the courtyard, if not here inside. So come on, August 6th. But today is the last Sunday after the Epiphany, and you always have the story of the Transfiguration because it's also known as Transfiguration Sunday. So I moved Huntington's Collect for the Feast of the Transfiguration on August 6th to today, since it's as appropriate today as it is on August 6th. But not only did I learn that Huntington wrote it, later on I learned where he wrote it. I learned that he loved the same place me and my family love to go. Huntington loved going up to Maine, or should I say down to Maine, to Mount Desert Island in Acadia National Park. Yet another one of the boo hiss moments of the coronavirus this past summer was the first summer in 16 summers that we have not gone to MDI and Acadia. Hopefully this summer that will change because it has become a very special, you know, magical place for me and my family. And it's no surprise to me that Huntington found it the same. And it was on the summit of Sargent Mountain, there on Mount Desert Island, one August 6th in the 1890s, that Huntington wrote this collect. Now, we still haven't been up Sargent Mountain yet. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty long hike, and we usually settle for shorter and easier hikes, especially after I fell off that cliff. Uh, I'll tell you about that some other time. Uh, going on shorter and easier hikes, or we end up driving up to Cadillac Mountain, or going for popovers at Jordan Pond, or you're know, playing beachside at Echo Lake. But I think at some point we will make the pilgrimage, as it were, up Sargent Mountain, although it's not exactly the, the kind of pilgrimage most people would probably get excited about. I think it will be great to eventually reach that summit of Sargent Mountain, and once we're there, pray that prayer. Pray that prayer in the place that inspired Huntington to write that prayer. But I know you don't have to go up to the summit of Sargent Mountain to, to get a sense of why Huntington would be inspired to, to do this, to write this. You wouldn't even have to go to Mount Desert Island or, or to Maine, for that matter. Chances are there's a place that you find special, what those practitioners of Celtic spirituality call thin places, those places of inspiring beauty. That might be the one and only bright spot about the coronavirus is that it forced me and my family to explore our local surroundings in a way we never had before. And we have discovered all kinds of places to go for walks, for, for hikes, you know, special places, thin places, all inspiring places. And now I, along with my dog Mocha, try to take a walk every Thursday at 3 p.m. in one of those places that we've discovered. And this Thursday at 3 p.m., we will walk parts of the Discover Hamilton Trail. And I hope you'll join me and Mocha. A dog is not necessary, but welcome. So just park at Patton Park and meet at Patton's Tank. I don't like tanks, but as a visual, visual uh, gathering point, you know, it couldn't be better. So see you Thursday at the Tank at 3 for an awe-inspiring walk. End of advertisement. It's the story of the transfiguration that ends the season of Epiphany, the season of God's manifestations with the ultimate manifestation of the king in his beauty, as Huntington puts it in his prayer. The manifestation of God's power, all light and bright, all glorious, and all done without the distractions of the disquietude of this world as the prayer states. It's almost like the transfiguration is God's little vacation from the toils and troubles of this world. And there's something to be said for that, to, to get away, to get away with God, to retreat and refresh with God, to be on vacation with God. But I don't think 
that's what Huntington had in mind when he wrote this prayer. I found a sermon Huntington had preached to the graduating class of the Episcopal Theological School in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, what became the Episcopal Divinity School. And his sermon to that graduating class of future clergy was on the Transfiguration, which is probably no surprise. And in it, he said, some of us may have been accustomed to regarding the scene on the Holy Mount as an exquisitely beautiful vignette, a glimpse of heaven permitted as by a lightning flash, briefly to irradiate the otherwise somber atmosphere of Christ's ministry. In other words, we tend to think of the transfiguration as a little vacation from the humdrum, so you can get through the humdrum, because life, ministry, is more tedious than majestic. A little majesty to help with the tedium. But then Huntington does something interesting that most other commentators do not. He expounds on the transfiguration in terms of sacrifice and sympathy. Yes, he says, it is glorious to behold the transfigured Christ, but the transfiguration is a sign of Christ's vocation, and his vocation is sacrifice. So what we see in the transfiguration is Jesus as the Lamb of God without blemish, one of us, but without sin. Certainly a sign to revel and glory in, as Peter kind of does, but it can't be forgotten that this is all done for the sake of sacrifice. So that the Lamb of God, the one without sin, can go and take away the sin of the world. Jesus has climbed this mountain only in anticipation and affirmation of the other mountain Jesus is yet to climb, Calvary's Hill, where he will be lifted up for all the world to see, high upon the cross. So as it turns out, the transfiguration is hardly a vacation. Instead, it makes clear his vocation. Huntington said, God clothed Jesus with light as with a garment, in token of his being duly robed for sacrifice. And for Huntington, this sacrifice is intimately connected to sympathy, to the life we see Jesus living, to the things we see Jesus doing, which is all part and parcel of Jesus' priesthood. So therefore, it's all part and parcel of our priesthood, because we are all priests, even if you don't write priest in the occupation line of a form like I do. This sympathy we see in the life and works of Jesus is for Huntington what the priesthood of all believers is about. And so we see these two, sacrifice and sympathy, summed up, manifested in Jesus in his transfiguration. Sacrificial sympathy. Huntington, de Huntington describes what this looks like in terms of clergy, since that's who he's talking to, future clergy. But I think he would agree that this applies to everyone. You just need to transpose it into your own life. He said, distinguished rector he may be. They were all he's back then. Distinguished rector he may be. Eminent divine, accomplished theologian, versatile pulpit orator, dignified celebrant. But if he be devoid of sympathetic insight into other souls, their needs, their temptations, their sins, their sorrows, their weaknesses, their aspirations, their longings, their regrets, their despondencies, their doubts, 
their fears. The chrism of heaven's anointing has been withheld from him. True priest, he is not. In other words, no sympathy, no sympathy like we see in Jesus, no priest. And that goes for everyone. In concluding his sermon, Huntington had this to say to these graduates, and I think it's a word for us as well during this time of uncertainty and anguish and inhospitableness. Huntington said in conclusion, look out upon the world and see what it is, a world heavy-hearted and sorrow-laden. Look again and see it what it also is, a world transfigured in the light of the good news that God is love, that Christ is risen, and that humanity is free. Go out to meet that world, not as if authority had been conferred on you to lord it over the minutest fraction of God's heritage, but humbly thankful that the privilege is yours of giving all your strength and all your talents to the kindly service of others so that you may help some of them to find and to know God. Be not cast down, but hopeful. Do not vilify the generation in which your lot is cast. Ask great things from it and expect them. Be not pessimists, but believers. Huntington wrote another collect, another prayer that we also find in the Book of Common Prayer. It's used on the Monday of Holy Week, the week leading up to Jesus' death and resurrection. And for those of you who have been tuning in for morning prayer on Fridays at 9 a.m. on Facebook Live, this will sound familiar. But we hope you'll join with us on Facebook Live, not just on Fridays for morning prayer, but every weekday at 9 a.m. with Mother Susan on Mondays and Tuesdays and me Wednesdays through Fridays. But if you've been joining us for morning prayer on Fridays, you've heard this before. Because we pray this prayer every Friday, since it's called a collect for Fridays. Fridays, of course, the day on which Jesus was crucified and died. This is a good prayer that Huntington wrote. A prayer that I sometimes wonder if he wrote to complement his collect for the transfiguration. That, in a sense, you need both of these. You need to be reminded of the glory. But you also need to be reminded of what the glory reveals. Sacrificial sympathy. And so I've added that other prayer that Huntington wrote as well. Mother Susan also prayed that one for us earlier. But now I'd like to end by praying these two prayers one more time. And that we hold these two prayers together in our hearts as we prepare our hearts for a holy Lent so that we can see Christ's glory in the cross and in the cross recognize not only Christ's vocation, but ours as well. Let us pray. O God, who on the Holy Mount revealed to chosen witnesses your well-beloved Son, wonderfully transfigured, in raiment white and glistening, mercifully grant that we, being delivered from the disquietude of this world, may by faith behold the King in his beauty, who with you, O Father, and you, O Holy Spirit, lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, whose most dear Son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain, and entered not into glory before he was crucified, mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, 
who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen. Let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Beholding God's glory in the world about us and in the faces of our sisters and brothers, we offer our prayers responding, Lord, hear our prayer. Word made flesh, enlighten the world with the fruits of your peace, that all your children may be fed, educated, sheltered, and loved. Let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Bear of the cross, strengthen us to pick up the cords of this world and dispel their power, that we may live according to your commandments and in the liberty of the Holy Spirit, let us pray, Lord, hear our prayer. Rabbi and teacher, empower your priest to preach the gospel and to live its message, proclaiming to others your forgiveness and love, your eternal generosity and daily presence in our lives. Let us pray, Lord, hear our prayer. Son of God, transfigure your church by giving us the faith and courage to choose those things that bring spiritual life to the community and to let go of those things which drain energy and joy. Let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Rock of our salvation, strengthen those who work in the service industry. Help them deal with difficult people and situations 
and empower their employers to provide fair wages and safe working environments. Let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Bread of life, may this Eucharistic meal nourish us with thanksgiving and gratitude. Let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Incarnate one, be with those who have departed this life in your faith and fear, that their souls and the souls of all the faithful may rest in peace and rise in glory. Let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. With the light of Christ to reveal the glory of God, we continue our prayers. Hasten, O Father, the coming of your kingdom, and grant that we, your servants, who now live by faith, may with joy behold your Son at his coming in glorious majesty, even Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And, and also with you. Peace, Professor. Peace, Daniel. Peace, peace Reverend Mother. Peace, Father. Peace, Ezra. Peace. peace. And peace to everyone sitting out in the courtyard. If anyone's here sitting out in the courtyard, peace to all those who may be in the parking lot. Uh, and, uh, and of course, peace to all of you who are worshiping with us online. But wherever you happen to find yourself, please be seated. And good morning and welcome uh, to Christ Church. Um, it'll be great to see all you folks who are worshiping with us online at some point here. And it's coming. It's coming. I, I got a good feeling about things. Uh, which is unusual for me to have a good th feeling about things. So yeah, so uh, it's coming. Um, a, a few announcements. Uh, one is uh, this coming Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, the beginning of Lent. Um, and as we've mentioned, uh, as you can imagine, it's different. And as I, we have mentioned before, we are not allowed to do the imposition of ashes. So uh, the diocese is allowing us to get you ashes so that you can uh, self-impose ashes if you want or impose ashes on each other in your household, your pod there. Um, it, uh, and there will be a point during the service uh, which will be broadcast on Facebook Live at 5 p.m. of music and meditations. There will be an appropriate place during that service for you to self-impose the ashes. But if you want ashes, you have to let us know, like today. Right, Mother Susan? Yeah. Oh, to, even, to, wow. You even have until tomorrow to let Mother Susan know that you would like some ashes for Ash Wednesday. And uh, just as we've been uh, delivering uh, 
communion, the bread, for, for you folks to participate uh, during the, the communion part of our service. Uh, they, these ashes will be delivered to you uh, by a cadre of vestry members, I think, mainly. Um, so thanks to all those vestry members who are willing to deliver, uh, and maybe even Mother Susan as well. You're not, who knows? Uh, but it all depends upon how many we hear from. We've heard from a few, uh, but we suspect there might be a few more. So you got basically 24 hours uh, to, to let Mother Susan know that you would like some ashes. And as I mentioned, the Ash Wednesday service, which will be on Facebook Live, uh, and if you want, you can sit in the courtyard, or, uh, but you know, we're not coming out to you, uh, but if you wanna be here in the courtyard, you're welcome to do that. Uh, but it's Facebook Live, 5 p.m., with music and meditations uh, for the beginning of Lent on Ash Wednesday. Sundays, uh, you know, uh, the nine o'clock hour, we have uh, formation for adults and for families that continues uh, via Zoom. Uh, it's a uh, small group Bible study format right now uh, for, uh, that's looking at the, the, the day's gospel lessons. So Mother Susan and some others looked at the, the story of the transfiguration today. Um, and so that'll happen next Sunday as well. It'll be uh, that Sunday's gospel lesson. Uh, so you know, if you get Lori's email, you'll have the link to that Zoom. So you know, come and participate. It's, it's, uh, you don't have to prepare much, just show up. And then you work through the text, ask some questions, some, uh, work through the, the questions that are provided, uh, and a little bit of time for checking in as well, fellowship. Uh, but that's at nine o'clock. And also for families, uh, there's a separate email that you, are, you receive from Naomi that has a link uh, for our breakout rooms uh, for uh, kids fifth grade and under, middle school and high school. So we hope that you'll uh, consider that as part of your family routine on Sunday morning to participate in that as well. And again, that link uh, will be coming uh, on a weekly basis from Naomi. Um, there is a, the Essex County Community Organization is having a community meeting via Zoom uh, this coming Thursday at 6 p.m. Uh, and you can, uh, if you get Lori's email, there's details in your bulletin about that. Uh, ECHO is a broad-based community organization that organizes churches uh, and uh, synagogues, uh, other people of faith around issues of common concern in our area. And certainly one of those issues uh, has recently been uh, looking at uh, racism and the development of a beloved community. So uh, we hope if you're interested, you'll consider joining that ECHO community meeting this Thursday at 6 p.m. The, the um, groups, uh, women's spirituality group, the men's life group, uh, they continue. Uh, online board game night, Tuesday night, that continues. Uh, as I said, the walking club, Thursday, 3 p.m., Ham parts of the uh, Discover Hamilton Trail. Uh, bring your dog, just come if you don't have a dog, but let me know. Uh, and that's the, a lot of the, just a few of the things that are happening uh, during the course of our week. Uh, and of course, we'll see you next Sunday uh, for the first Sunday of Lent. Through Christ, let us continually offer to God the sacrifice of praise that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. But do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because in the mystery of the word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts, to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest.
Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit, to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercy. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. 
Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace.
let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.